I'm going to give an overview of, of NURSE today and welcome you all to NURSE. Um, so my name is Rebecca Hartman Baker. I lead the user engagement group at NURSE. And you may also know me from the email that arrives in your inbox on every Monday that I sent to you, the NURSE weekly email. Okay, so in, in my part of the presentation here, I'm gonna have kind of an introduction to NURSE. What are we, what do we do? Talk about our hardware and our software. Uh, how you can interact with NERSC and user responsibilities and expectations. Okay, so let's get started with our introduction. So NERSC is an acronym for the National Energy Research Scientific Computing Center. So we were established in 1974. We were the first unclassified supercomputer center. The original mission of NERSC was to enable computational science as a complement to magnetically controlled plasma experiments. Uh, our mission has changed a bit. Uh, today, our mission is to accelerate scientific discovery at the DOE Office of Science through high performance computing and extreme data analysis. Uh, NERSC is a national user facility. We have a really diverse workload. We have over 9,000 users. We have like 900 projects. We have a thousand different codes that are running on our machines and hundreds of users every day. Uh, the allocations at NERSC are primarily controlled by the Department of Energy. So 80% of all allocations go through the DOE uh, production awards called ERCAP. And ERCAP uh, awards people anywhere from you know, 100 hours to uh, 10,000 hours of node hours on NERSC. Uh, this is a proposal-based uh, award system and it's and the awards are chosen by our DOE program managers. A nurse doesn't have any control over the, that 80% of the awards. Um, another 10% goes to the DOE Oscar Leadership Computing Challenge. Uh, and so these are projects that are more high risk but high potentially high reward. And then the remaining 10% belongs to the nurse reserve. And so we use that for our projects, um, so some of it goes to overhead uh, for nurse staff, but a lot of it also goes to uh, science or uh, things that we are particularly interested in. So over the past couple of years, uh, much of that reserve has gone actually to COVID research, for example. So our users produce really amazing groundbreaking science. So. As far as we know, users of NERSC produce more publications than users of any other center in the world. We get about 2,500 publications per year that are naming NERSC as a, as a resource that they used. Uh, so DOE, uh, from their perspective, we give out awards to different, um, different science areas. And, and so this pie chart kind of illustrates that. And hold on just one second while I cough. All right, thanks. Sorry about that. Um, so the DOE Office of Science gives out the awards and, and then there's kind of these programs within the Office of Science. And each of them gets a share of the pie, as you can see. So next I'm gonna talk about nurse hardware. So, uh, you know, we're always trying to get better systems every couple of years for our users so that you can do more science and uh, use the latest and greatest technologies. So, uh, so this, this slide sort of shows you uh, like a timeline of, of the different um, systems that, that NERSC has procured and then will procure in the future. So right now uh, we have Corey on the floor, but it's gonna retire at the beginning of the new allocation year. So early 2023, January, it will retire. Uh, and then we have Perlmutter on the floor right now uh, then we're current, that we're currently working on to get it uh, to a point where it will be able to be the primary uh, resource for nurse users. And then in another few years, probably not actually 2024, maybe 2025, uh, we will get our next system, our NERSC 10 system, which is expected to be an exaflop system. Okay, so this is a kind of a, a, a diagram, I guess, of all of the things that we have going on here at NERSC. So we've got Perlmutter and Corey, and as I said, Corey's gonna be retiring 
So we're going to basically ignore Corey today. Uh, so we've got these two systems and they are connected to um, our nurse network and they're also connected to uh, some important file systems that we have. Uh, and so I'm going to tell you briefly a bit more about those, but later presentations will provide you with even more information. Okay, so Corey has two partitions to it. So it has some nodes that are of the Haswell CPU architecture and some nodes that are the KNL architecture. Uh, and so we can kind of differentiate between the types of jobs that people might want to run on Corey. Uh, so the Haswell nodes, we consider those to be really good for throughput. And you can even do single core types of jobs. And it has kind of longer wall time limits for these smaller jobs, but it has pretty long queues. Uh, the KNL nodes, they are really good for performance if you have a type of code that can take advantage of many cores. Um, and we encourage people to run large jobs on it. And, and it's a, a partition of the machine is, this partition is four times larger than the other. So it generally has much shorter queues. Uh, and then we also have a queue called the flex queue that can increase your throughput and give you a discount on the charges that we charge you for using the machine. Uh, now, Perlmutter, which is our new machine, this is the focus of today's training. Uh, Perlmutter has two partitions. It has some GPU nodes and it has some CPU-based nodes. Uh, and so the GPU nodes, they just have an immense compute power because of those GPUs. And we really love it when people run large jobs using many GPUs. We really encourage that. Uh, and it's really great for any codes that can exploit a GPU compute power. On the other hand, we have the CPU partition, and it has some very powerful CPUs in it. But of course, CPUs are e completely eclipsed by, uh, by GPUs, right? So it, the total is only about 10% of the GPU compute power. Uh, it is equivalent in compute power to all of Cori, which we had just talked about. Uh, and it, it functions more like a traditional cluster that people might be used to. Uh, and so we would encourage this, the use of the, the CPU nodes on, on Perlmutter for these types of high throughput jobs that people are looking to do. Uh, that is a great place to, to do those types of jobs. Okay, so now we've got our file systems. So we've got our global file systems, which is homes and community. We've got our local file systems, which are the scratch systems on our machines. And then we've got a long-term storage system called HPSS. Now I am just breezing through all of this because there will be a lot more depth uh, of coverage later on about how to use these resources. So your home file system. So this is, this is mounted on all of our systems. And so when you log in to Perlmutter, or, or Corey, but Perlmutter, because we're focusing on Perlmutter today, uh, the directory that you get dropped into by default is your home directory. And so it's a permanent, relatively small amount of storage. We give you uh, 40 gigs of, of storage there. Um, and it's, so like I said, it's on all platforms. It is not tuned for performance. It's just there to store things. Uh, we, like I said, we give you 40 gigs, we cannot change that quota. It's, it's just our policy because there are other places where you can store more data. Uh, and it, it also has these snapshot backups. So it has a seven day history. So if you accidentally delete something today, uh, then you can go through the snapshot and find it, find the copy of it that was there yesterday. Uh, so your home directory is the perfect place for storing small data, such as source codes or shell scripts. That's what I do with my home directory. Now, we also have the community file system, okay? And every project has a directory in the community file system. And so this is more permanent, larger storage. It is also mounted on all platforms, so you can access it on Cori or Perlmutter. Um, it has, so so performance for parallel jobs like you can run your parallel jobs on there it's not going to be as good as your scratch uh and then you can change your quota we can change your quota on the community file system um if you need more space on there we can generally accommodate that 
Uh, another nice thing about the community file system, it also has these snapshot backups. So with a seven day history. So again, if you make a mistake, you delete a file, you can find it if it was there yesterday and, and restore it. And we really see the community file system as the perfect place for you to share your data within your research group. Okay, uh, so next we'll talk about Scratch file systems. So the Scratch file systems are local to the machine. Uh, they are a large temporary storage place. They're really optimized for rewrite sort of operations, not really for storage because that's not what they're for. Uh, they're not backed up. So if you delete a file there uh, or it gets purged, which I'll talk about shortly, uh, it's too bad, you've, you've lost it, unfortunately. Now we have a purge policy where we come through and if there's a file that has not been used or accessed for 12 weeks, we will we reserve the right to delete it. And so we do go through periodically and clean up old files that people aren't using anymore. Uh, but the scratch system is just the perfect place for staging data and performing your computations. Finally, we have our HPSS long-term storage system. So HPSS stands for High Performance Storage System. It's an archive, really, you can think of it that way. It's an archival storage for infrequently accessed data. Uh, and it actually functions in a hierarchical fashion. So if you put data on it, it first ingests that onto a, a, an array of disks, which is something that we're all used to in file systems. But then uh, after that data has not been used for, it gets migrated to a large tape subsystem for long-term retention. And again, if you want more information on HPSS, how to use it, how to access it, you'll get to see that in, in later presentations. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about using NERSC file systems because I think this is a really important message for everyone to understand. So I'm gonna use an analogy, which of course is imperfect, but I, when I was growing up in the Southern United States, I learned that the way to a, a man's heart is, is through his stomach. I think that the way to uh, a, a user's brain is also through their stomach. So we're gonna talk about baking and I apologize to people for whom it's almost lunchtime. But let's say that computing is like baking and let's say that the input to whatever you're computing is kind of like the ingredients that you would use for your baking and your output is a cake. Okay, let's say that for the sake of argument. So NERSC is kind of like this gigantic shared kitchen space where it has all the latest kitchen gadgets. So you can think of the supercomputers as ovens. Uh, you can think of your home and CFS file systems as kind of your pantry and your fridge. You can think of HPSS as a freezer and Scratch is like your kitchen counter. Okay, so when you bake, ideally, you stage your ingredients from your pantry and your fridge, plus maybe something from the, refreeze, from the freezer that you, you know, less frequently use, like frozen blueberries or something like that. So you stage all of those things onto your kitchen counter. Uh, similarly, when you're working on a supercomputer, you're going to stage all of your data and your executable onto the Scratch file system. Then after baking, you, you need to clean up after yourself. Okay, it's okay to let your cake cool on the kitchen counter of our shared kitchen space, but uh, you need to leave spa the space clean for the next person who comes along to use the kitchen resources. Uh, so we will, we will uh, let you uh, cool your cake for a while. Uh, we're hoping that you're gonna throw away your your uh, used eggshells and you're gonna take your bowls and you're gonna wash them in the sink or whatever to continue this, this bad analogy. Uh, but if you don't do that, then after a while, we will clean up after you, but it's not gonna be in the way that you would want. So we're gonna throw all your stuff in the trash, including your cake, if you leave it there too long. So that's why we really encourage you to clean up anything that's on scratch, don't leave it on there for longer than, definitely not longer than 12 weeks, uh, but 
don't leave it on there for very long so that you make sure that you get it off of there and into a more persistent form of storage where it will be safe from uh, us cleaning up after you. Okay, I'm gonna talk about software now. So on, on uh, Perlmutter, we have the Cray, well, they're made by HPE slash Cray, and the Cray supercomputer operating system is a version of Linux. It's kind of an optimized version of Linux. Uh, we provide compilers on the machines. Uh, we also provide many libraries. Uh, some of them are provided by our vendor. Some of them are provided by NERSC ourselves. Uh, we have some applications that we compile and support. Uh, and then, you know, as I said before, for more details, check out our later presentations and you'll learn a lot more about this. Uh, so we do provide a lot of chemistry and materials science applications uh, for our users uh, because they're so popular and they are so well used. Um, we also have a very rich data ecosystem. You can see we have all of these different types of applications, libraries, um, databases, you know, data management, all kinds of things for people to use, workflows. Uh, so that's to keep something to keep in mind. Um, we keep, we have some policies at NERSC. So one of them is that we, we keep our software version defaults consistent for the allocation here. That's our goal anyway. Some uh, software, um, we may have to make exceptions because there may be security issues or we may have a major operating system upgrade that we're required to do. And then the, the, the uh, software defaults that we had are no longer compatible with that operating system. So sometimes we do make an exception for that, but that's generally our goal is to keep the software version defaults for the whole allocation year. Now we classify our software at NERSC into four support levels. So we've got priority, provided, minimal, and restricted. Uh, and so the only things you really need to know is that restricted software, we don't allow it on our resources. So if you have export controlled software, please don't bring it to NERSC. We have uh, generally, otherwise we, we, there's some that we provide with a high priority and we make sure that it works correctly. Uh, and then there's others that we have sort of less of a commitment to. Okay, let's talk about interacting with NERSC. So, we're going to talk about consulting and account support and operations and our nurse user group. So we have a big team of folks who are lined up to help you all with any kind of issues that you might run into at nurse. And so this is pictures of most of them, but not all of them. So we are the first line uh, when you interact with when you submit a ticket or I say or calling, but we don't have a phone anymore. Uh, in 2021, we handled 7,229 tickets from 2,673 unique users. So you all keep us busy and uh, we're grateful for that, but we're also happy to help you. Um, so we promise that our first response will be within four business hours and our business hours are Monday through Friday, eight to five Pacific time, except holidays. Uh, we will help you to resolve your problems and keep you apprised of the progress of what's going on. Uh, we'll attempt to accommodate your needs that might not fit within our operating structure, but we'll try to see what we can do, maybe help you to fit within that if possible. Um, and of course, we always welcome feedback and constructive criticism from our users. Now, when you are submitting a ticket to us, please help us to help you and provide some specifics about what's going on. So uh, sometimes we get tickets where somebody just writes in and they say, my job failed. And that's not very helpful to us. We can't help you if you're just telling us that your job failed, you need to provide us with more information. Uh, and you'll hear more about that in another presentation later. Uh, another thing that we offer is user appointments. So we started off offering office hours which was just basically an open Zoom meeting where you could join to get help with a particular topic. But the problem with office hours, especially for all of you professors out there, you may understand this, is you have long periods where nobody comes. And then suddenly you have like people who just join on at the same time. 
Uh, and so it's kind of inefficient use of everyone's time. So we went with user appointments instead. So we offer 30 minute appointments on a variety of different topics. And if you wanna schedule an appointment, just type in your browser on nurse.as.me and you can get to our appointment uh, page to schedule an appointment. Okay, another thing I wanna bring up is user training. So I saw somebody had a question about what training should they attend? Uh, so we provide a, a wide, diverse training program for all of our users for different skill levels, different interests. All of our trainings are recorded and professionally captioned and posted to the NERSC YouTube channel. Also, the slides for any training are posted to the training event webpage after the fact. Uh, so upcoming events that you may be interested in, especially if you're trying to get onto Perlmutter, are we've got this GPUs for Science Day on October 25th. I think that will be a really good program for you. And also Data Day on October 26th and 27th. Uh, and of course, you can go to our training webpage to find out what's happening and what you have to uh, look forward to. Okay, next I'm gonna talk about operations. So we have operations staff on site 24 seven, every day, Christmas, 4th of July, Sundays at 2 a.m. There is always somebody there. Um, our operations staff, they know the health of the machines and they can help you with some tasks. So if there's a job that you're trying to kill that's really not dying, they could probably help you with that if it's an emergency. Uh, and then if there are any changes that you wanna to make to running to a running reservation, they can help you with that too. But otherwise, please avoid contacting our operations staff uh, except for under urgent circumstances, because they are very busy making sure that that the, everything is operating well. Uh, and so they're out there doing a lot of different tasks. Okay, next I'm going to talk about the nurse user group. So we have the nurse user group, we call it the NUG. It's our community of nurse users. It's a great source of advice and feedback for us. Uh, there's an executive committee with three representatives from each office program office um, in, in the DOE Office of Science, uh, plus three members at large. We have monthly teleconferences, uh, usually the third Thursday of the month at 11 a.m. Pacific time. Uh, the NUG also has a Slack channel that you can join. Um, and so if you click on that link, you'll need to log in in order to get to the invitation that you can click on and, and join the NUG Slack. I would encourage you to join it. It's a pretty Pretty good place to uh, talk to your peers and ask them questions and get help. Uh, and then also I'd like to invite you to join us for the NUG annual meeting. It's gonna be online October 12th through 14th. So coming up in just a few weeks. Uh, another thing I wanna talk about is uh, community engagement. So we do have some special interest groups through NUG on topics including wharf users and uh, scientific facility users. Uh, and then we also have plans in the works for building a cross-disciplinary nurse users community of practice uh, starting in 2023. Our initial target is going to be graduate students uh, because they are a plurality of nurse users. Uh, but for more information, I would encourage you to attend the NUG annual meeting on the Friday session. We will have a 30-minute talk on our community of practice. So that should be very exciting. Okay. Last but not least, I have one minute, but I think I'm gonna make it, user responsibilities and expectations. So what we want from you all is to be kind to your neighbor users, okay? Don't abuse the shared resources. Sometimes people will use a, a, a login node too much, a bit too excessively, and that kind of messes things up for your neighbors. Um, use your allocation smartly. So pick the right resource for your job and your data. So. Uh, you know, so that you use your allocation well. Um, back up your stuff, especially from scratch where there's a purge policy. Uh, acknowledge us in your papers. Um, when If nobody ever acknowledged us, then nobody would know that we were important to your research, right? So, so please acknowledge us so that we can stay in business. Uh, and then finally, pay attention to security. Uh, don't share your account with others. And, and please, Report to us if you see anything suspicious or if you're if you have a question about security. We'd love to hear from you on that. So that concludes my 
talk. And I just want to thank you all again and welcome you to nurse. <laughs>